Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at this webinar on policies to improve freight transport systems in cities. I just wanted to remind you all that the registration for Habitat 3 is already open, and we invite you to register free of charge at our webpage uh, www.vivehabitat3.ec or if it's easier, habitat3.org <laughs> or through our um, social media. We will begin this webinar with a short introduction by a representative of Ecuador's Ministry of Urban Development and Housing. Then we will proceed to the seminar on policies to improve freight transport system in cities given by Dr. Jose Olguin Veras. After that, we will have a short one-question survey and we will proceed with a Q&A section. You can ask your questions throughout the seminar in the chat window. We will answer them at the end. Um, if you could also in the chat window tell us what country you're from, that will help us very much. Thank you. Now I introduce to you Rafael Mena from the Habitat and Human Settlement Secretary of Ecuador's Ministry of Urban Development and Housing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rafael Mena. I'm here on behalf of the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing of Ecuador. I'll be giving you a short introduction of today's webinar. Uh, the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing of Ecuador has been working for the last years in the construction of national urban policies that will help change the urban development model that has created unsustainable urban development and has fostered inequality in our cities all over the country. In this context, important events such as Habitat 3 provides us with a unique chance to start a conversation over what kind of cities we want and what should we do to build them. We are committed to principles such as the right to the city, the, uh, the social function of the land, and to the idea that living well in cities should be for all and not only for those who can afford it. All of these are principles included in our constitution and law. However, it is not enough to have them written down if we do not, have, if we do not come with a strategy and the means to implement them. We believe that in, in a country where more than 70% of the people live in cities, we can no longer delight the national debate on these issues. We have found that hosting these important international meetings has awakened the interest in the city planning and management in universities, in the architecture, engineering community, stakeholders, and in the general public. Therefore, this, this is an opportunity that we should be taking full advantage of. Making cities better is a huge effort, and one of the biggest challenges we face as a country is that the fastest growing cities are small and intermediate ones, precisely the cities that lack human and financial resources that will make good city planning and management possible. In this context, the Ministry of, is working very hard to provide cities with enough means to face the problems of fast urbanization, especially with national legal frameworks and training programs that will strengthen their capacities. We believe that making cities better is a collective effort, so we are pleased to begin this cycle of webinars, which is part of a bigger context of national urban debate that we hope will help us as a, as a country in the construction of a national urban agenda for more equitable, inclusive, and prosperous cities for all. This is webinar on policies to improve freight transport systems in cities. We'll discuss how to improve the efficiency of the freight transport systems in urban areas while improving the economic contributions of freight systems and reducing negative externalities. Uh, Dr. Jose Olguin Veras will hold the seminar. He is the William H. Hart Professor and Director of the Center for Infrastructure, Transportation and the Environment and the Volvo Research and Educational Foundation and the Center of Excellence on Sustainable Urban Freight Systems at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Dr. Jose Olguin Veras, uh, your presentation can start now. Okay. Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay. Now you can start. Well, it really gives me a great pleasure to uh, have this opportunity to tell you about the research that we are doing. Uh, to start, I want to mention that basically uh, a bit of our research, we focus on three major areas, how to improve the sustainability of the urban freight systems, how to do 
how to develop better models to do forecasts of freight activity. And we also work on the area of disaster response logistics. And by the way, I was in Ecuador several months ago, just after the earthquake, as part of this research. As, as, the, as it was mentioned, I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Urban Freight System. It's a coalition of about 25 research centers all over the world in which what we try to do is to develop a network of researchers uh, basically that collaborate in improving the sustainability of urban freight system. Now, when most people think about freight, uh, they tend to think about the most visible components, uh, big trucks, rail, ports, airports, and things like that. But we limit it in, in most cases they overlook the free activity that takes place in the urban context. And difficult as that is, basically building these large pieces of infrastructure, although it could be really difficult, is relatively easy compared to the challenges associated with how to improve the sustainability of urban deliveries. And this is basically one of the messages I want to uh, convey here today. Now, Key question is, why does it matter? Why should we bother with urban freight? There are several reasons for that. The first one is the significant role of metropolitan areas to the, to the economy. Let me show you some statistics. To start, about 80% of all manufacturers, I mean worldwide, are manufactured in metropolitan areas, because the reality is that nobody manufactures things in the middle of nowhere. In the U.S., just to give another statistic, about 80% of the cargo that is transported in the country has either origin or destination in the top 100 metropolitan areas. Again, that kind of reflects the, the role of manufacturing. The amount of cargo that is transported is tremendous. And as you can see here, in this uh, a bullet, a, it depends on the on income. In, in a city like New York, if you compute the amount of cargo that is transported for manufacturing, commerce, a, intermodal terminals, and the like, that and you divide that number by the total population, it's about 45 kilograms per person per day. In Beijing, that is 35, in Medellin, Colombia, it's 25, and in, in low-income cities like Port-au-Prince, it's about 8 kilograms per person per day. What's the implication of that? That the amount of cargo is directly related with income. With rising incomes, more cargo is transported and consumed, and then the problem will be even worse. A second a second a reason to improve urban freight is the two-way impact between the city and freight activity. We all know that freight activity produces congestion, pollution, noise, etc., etc., but at the same time, the congestion in the city has a really negative effect on the efficiency of supply chains. What I'm going to show you here, I present some results from a project that we are doing for the Inter-American Development Bank in which we develop a methodology to assess the impacts of congestion on supply chains. What you have in this picture is a, is a, is a GPS tracks of related for a truck that was making deliveries in Santiago, Chile. And we use this GPS data that we collected to assess the impacts of congestion. In this case here, basically, you cannot think much of this because, again, these are some of the signal errors associated with the bouncing of signals. But if you take a look at the dots, these dots are basically at an interval of three seconds. You can could, you could see there are sections here where the dots are very closely spaced because that is congestion. In other places, like here, you see the dots are spread apart because the truck is traveling with some speed. We could use this data to compute the impacts of congestion compared to the, uh, the, the transportation cost associated with a free flow conditions. If we do that, we obtain something like this. 
they have some results in this case for Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. And you see here, you have distance in the horizontal axis and you have cost in the others. And you see this spike here, this is congestion. And this is basically the increase in cost in transportation that is created by the congestion in, in, in that city. You can see here on top, this route, for instance, this delivery route had an extra cost of about 136%. The average for the city was about 107. And these trucks are basically trucks making deliveries to supermarkets. What that means is that the transportation cost to deliver it to these supermarkets in congested areas are basically double what they should be. And that has a ne very negative effect on people because at the end, consumers have to pay for that. Now, if you plot this, what you get is something like this. This here is the origin of the, of the truck. This is where the distribution center is. As you can see, as the truck travels and hit the, the center of Sao Paulo, the costs explode. Because again, because of the congestion associated with the, uh, in that particular area. Again, this is the equivalent results in this case for Santiago, Chile. You can see here the spikes produced by, a, by the, the congestion in the city. Again, and what you can see, if you, and we have results for, for multiple cities, and you find exactly the same pattern. Here you can see, again, as in the case of Sao Paulo, that as you move into the congested part of the city, again, this, the cost, the cost explode. What does it matter? Well, typically the last leg of deliveries represent about 30% of the total cost. And if you manage to find ways to reduce that cost, you are going to add tremendous stimulus to the economy. Now, why does it matter? Well, if, you, if the best way to think about the importance of free activity is to take a look at the different sectors, economic sectors you find in the economy. In this slide here, what you have is a, is a breakdown of the different sectors in the economy in two major groups. The first one is what we call freight intensive sectors. These are the sectors in the economy for which the production or consumption of freight is central to the economic activity. And on the other hand, you have non-freight intensive sectors. There are basically those in which freight production and consumption of freight is of relatively secondary importance. All these sectors consume freight in some fashion. Even, uh, even educational institutions, uh, government offices, etc. All of them use supplies. But for the time being, let's forget about the freight needs of this group of non-freight intensive sectors. Now, in this slide, what you have, this is basically the, the total number of establishments in freight intensive sectors. This is in the case, these are a statistic for the United States. Here you have number of establishments and then total employment. I want to highlight this thing here. The transportation sector represents about slightly less than 3% of the number of establishments and about 3.6% or 3.6% of the total employment. But that is not the, the most important component. The most important component is these totals over here. For about 45% of all establishments are in freight intensive sectors, meaning that any extra cost that is produced by congestion or inefficiency or uh, public policies that are counterproductive are going to impact 45% of the establishment and about, for, uh, about half the establishment, the, the employment in the city. In essence, freight is the free activity is tremendously important to the urban economy, quality of life, sustainability, 
and environmental justice. And all of that has to be taken into account. The freight transportation activity, the, the, the most important impact of freight transportation activity are spread out urban economies. Now, for transportation planners, the key question is, uh, how do we quantify the activity? How do we know the size? How do, and we need, to, without quantification, without quantifying the number of freight trips are producing cities, there is no way to have, to, de to define policies to address them, to improve them. What I'm going to show you is basically results from a study that we conducted for the, um, for the National Cooperative Freight Research Program in the United States, in which we estimated a models to estimate free activity. Uh, the results are basically uh, represented in this figure that shows as a function of employment the number of, of freight trips that are generated. And we also produce, by the way, uh, estimates of the number of service trips. That are those associated with, let's say, technicians, uh, photocopy repair persons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are also important because they use a tremendous amount of parking spaces for their activities. Graphically, uh, the statistic in the U.S. Uh, kind of can, could be summarized in this figure. What you have here is that, in essence, freight trip generation is heavily correlated with population. In fact, in this equation here, if you take the population of the city and you multiply it by 0 0.065, you get a very good idea about the number of freight trips. In an area like the, the New York City metropolitan area with 20 million people, that translates into about 1.4 million deliveries every single day. Now, something important is, is now the increase in internet deliveries. As you can see here, in the United States in 2009, the internet deliveries were, deli were generated at a rate of 0 0.04 times the population of the area. That was about 50% lower than the deliveries to commercial establishment I mean, indicated here. Nowadays, in the United States, our guess is that internet deliveries represent about 0.10, obviously generated at a rate of about 0.10 times the population of the city. Why is that important? Well, that means that in cities like New York, there are more deliveries to households than deliveries to commercial establishments. Now, why does it matter? Well, in Seoul, South Korea, that rate is 0.20. That means the rate of deliveries in New York today could be double in the future. And that will impose tremendous a impact on congestion. Now, in cities, when people think about large traffic generators, most people think about the port, about the truck terminal, about these big units. But in reality, these are not the large traffic generators. What you have here, this is basically a, a GIS map of the island of Manhattan. And you see here the amount of freight trips that are generated. To those of you that know New York, this is Central Park, and this is basically south of Central Park. This is what we call Midtown Manhattan. And you see these humongous spikes in freight traffic, and most people wonder, but what is creating that? Because in Manhattan, there are no container terminals or truck terminals and the like. But who are these generators? Well, let me show you a picture. This is a picture of the Empire State. In the Empire State, there are about 780 commercial establishments. This is one of the last traffic generators in Manhattan. In, in fact, in Manhattan, the restaurants in Manhattan, there are basically about 10,000 of them, produce more, more truck trips than the port. And there are 80 buildings and large traffic generators that produce between 4 to 8% of total freight traffic. And this is who produces congestion. 
if you examine what's happening in other cities, you find similar results. In essence, free activity is heavily driven by urban deliveries. Why do, is that important? Well, if you have a lot of urban deliveries, you also need a space for these deliveries to make. You need to assign parking spaces or loading bays or loading areas to allow all these vehicles to take place, or to, to, to park to make deliveries. And that is a big problem. In Manhattan, there are about uh, 10 zip codes for which the demand for parking is larger than the linear capacity of the streets. That means there is no way that deliveries could be made within the law. And, and, and if, if there are not enough uh, loading areas for trucks to make deliveries, the truckers are going to double park because they have to park closer to the co to the customers. They're going to produce increase. They're going to increase congestion, pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what could be done to improve freight in, in metropolitan areas? In reality, a lot could be done. What I'm going to present you here is basically uh, some of the results of a major project that we did, again, for the National Cooperative Freight Research Program. All of this is accessible through the web, in which we produce like a, a manual, like a, a guideline, on how to improve a urban freight. In essence, the, all the techniques that could be used are kind of summarized in this uh, slide. In essence, you have at one end, you have, a, you could make improvement to the supply. In this case, the infrastructure. This improvement could be major or minor, depending on the investment. And at the other end, you have a demand management policies in which what you try to do is to is to induce changes in the behavior of the receivers of the cargo in order to increase the sustainability. In between these two ends, between infrastructure and demand, you also have a wide range of, uh, of policies related to parking, technologies, uh, traffic management, pricing and taxation, and logistical systems that I cannot discuss within the constraint of the amount of time that I that was allotted to. And all of that you could find information in the um, in the internet website that I uh, mentioned before. Now one of the products here basically that is uh, extremely useful for practitioners is what we call the initiative selector. What this dynamic web page does, this is a dynamic web page that for a given problem, let's say that you have a problem pertaining to congestion, lack of infrastructure, a, for a given area of the city involving, in this case, all traffic and large trucks, what you do, in the, you click, the, you, you define the type of problem that you have, and this web page is going to return to you a number of initiatives. If you click in one of them, what you will get is a one pager that kind of uh, describes the initiative with links to the corresponding sections in the guide. And that, what that does is to provide a dynamic way to explore the contents of the document. And, uh, and that is basically a very efficient way for individuals interested in, uh, in urban freight to kind of explore the document. Now, the undeniable re reality is that innovation is needed in this field. Because again, uh, the reality is that uh, focusing, trying to improve the efficiency of urban freight is a relatively new area, and innovation is needed. Why is that? Well, in essence, this is the, all problems involving freight are basically in need of collaboration between stakeholders because the public sector handles one uh, part of the problem, typically the infrastructure. The private sector operates the system. Academia 
uh, is in charge of research. And then you have the communities that enjoy the benefit of having access to supplies, but also suffer the impacts. And we're facing a situation in which all players control only a piece of the pie. In essence, and collaboration is needed in order to break past the status quo. Now, in one of the examples I'm going to discuss here is basically the concept of off-hour deliveries, in which what they try to do is to use policies to induce a change of delivery to the to the to the off hours. I'm going to present you examples from three different cities. This one is New York, that was a collaboration between the New York City Department of Transportation, the US Department of Transportation, and our center. You have the pictures of regular deliveries in this in the upper left, and then night deliveries in the lower right. And as you can see, the truck is able to park in front of the store, in this case a hotel, and make deliveries very, very rapidly. In the in the upper left, you don't you do not even see the truck because the truck is parked farther away and they have to spend a lot of time moving the cargo from the parking location all the way to the hotel. This program has been a tremendous success. Uh, currently we have about uh, 400 companies in Manhattan doing uh, of our deliveries. It has been tremendous success. We estimate that uh, of our deliveries in Manhattan might lead to economic savings in the range of 100 to 200 million dollars a year. I mean, both in terms of uh, direct savings to the to the companies and congestion reduction to the rest of the of the traffic. However, this is not limited to to New York. Uh, what I'm going to show you is basically some of the results that we obtained from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And we started this basically as a collaboration between the University of Sao Paulo and our center. And basically we managed to engage the support of the um, of the trucking associations and the city. Again, basically you can see here examples of deliveries being made in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, the next one is from Bogota, Colombia. Again, in this case, it's a collaboration between the public sector, the private sector, and researchers. In the case of Bogota, we implemented a number of delivery routes during the night hours. Obviously, you can see here, I mean, these uh, green trajectories, they represent the delivery routes that, of the companies that participated in this pilot. You could see here in this slide uh, the impact on both distance in the horizontal axis, axis and then a uh, travel time on the vertical axis. And these blue arrows kind of signal the, uh, the decreases in both distance and, and travel time. Total, uh, if you compute the, the savings, in essence, we are talking about the average savings in the range of 35%, which is about the same that we found in Sao Paulo and in, in New York. It's 30, about 35% cheaper to make deliveries at night. Environmental impacts. What you have here is basically the, the percent reduction of emissions on a per kilometer basis that we have estimated using the GPS data collected in the in the research. And basically here what you have, we are talking about in the case of Bogota that is um, a, have a very a difficult and challenging street network. It's basically in the range of 13%. The reductions in New York City and Sao Paulo are basically in the range of I mean 42 to 67%. We're talking about tremendous savings. Uh, just to conclude, uh, I want to say that it is important to, to keep in mind that free activity is not an end in itself. 
And this is not about, let's say, helping the, the trucking companies to get a better life or to, or to help them make more money. This is all about a helping urban economy, economies to do better. The reality is that the free activity that we see is only the physical expression of the economy. And in essence, we need to make sure that basically in, uh, we need to make sure that we help uh, all these economic activity do better. Something important here is, is the, the fact that we need to use a, a collaboration or a combination of approaches because infrastructure by itself will not solve the problem. A regulation by itself will not do it either. What we need is basically a combination of techniques that could help uh, increase the efficiency of this uh, important activity. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And this is, I'm going to leave with you this slide that have basically the, the key links to, this, uh, to the material I presented in my, in my talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Olguimberas, on behalf of the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing of Ecuador and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR, we would like to thank you for sharing your expertise and your contribution to the ongoing discussions on Habitat 3. Thank you. Now to our attendees, a short survey will appear on your screen at this moment. Please, if you can just answer it briefly before we can begin the Q&A. Um, in order to begin the Q&A, please, if you can just, in the question or chat section um, on the right, you can write your questions there, and we will be reading them to Dr. Jose Olguin Veras, who uh, will kindly answer them. We're just waiting for everyone to, to take this quick survey, and we'll continue. Okay, we almost everyone has voted. Oh, well, not voted, but taken the survey. Uh, we will continue with the Q and A. Um. We're going through the questions. There are people wondering if we are going to have the video of the webinar on a, on our webpage. We will, as the other seven webinars have been online. And uh, we have <laughs> we will have the, the video of the conference and the suggested lectures um, hung up on our webpage. And we're just waiting for everyone to make their questions. Um, if we can receive more questions, anybody that uh, has any any questions regarding the seminar, which I know was was greatly explained by Dr. Olguin Veras, was very interesting. Here we have a question. Uh, we're being asked for a second. Everyone is writing their questions, I think. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Monica Quintana. She asked, um, 
As freight transportation can be localized in any place of the city, do you recommend to combine urban transport system to be together with freight transport systems? Um, we cannot hear you, Dr. Olguin Veras. I don't know if you can uh, please check that your microphone is off mute. Okay. Perfect. Basically, the, uh, people have tried to use a mass transit system, buses and the like, to move cargo, but this uh, is too costly. Basically, the transfer is such that, that it cannot be done in an economical way. Now, what might be done is to use a, a street space. If you develop, a, let's say, a more uh, enlightened policy to, uh, to use a street space to make deliveries, that could be, I mean, that could be a good thing. Uh, for instance, a bus stops, there are some parts of the way in which the bus stops are very likely used for buses. I mean, if you could use those bus stops to make deliveries, that could be a good thing. Because if providing a space to make deliveries is, is a very straightforward way to reduce congestion. Because if the trucks do not have a space to park to make deliveries, they're going to double park. Because they have no choice. They cannot park farther away from the customers. If you're pushing a car that weighs, let's say, 75 kilograms, you cannot be parked farther away. And basically, you have policy in which uh, when we design a street space, we need to account for free activity. And that, 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 that has more promise than using a transit system for, to move freight. Okay, perfect. Thank you for answering. Um, we have another question. What do you think is the biggest challenge that developing cities, especially in Latin America, face regarding freight transportation systems? The biggest challenge both in developing and developed countries is a culture of confrontation between the public sector and the private sector. And I think that is the biggest challenge uh, because again, in most cases, the public sector look at the private sector as a whole bunch of people that are only interested in making money. And the public sector look at the, at the private sector look at the private sector, uh, the private sector look at the public sector as a whole bunch of bureaucrats that get on the way of doing business. Each side have, tend to have a very negative uh, opinion of the other. And in this, in this business, in this type of, you need some sort of collaboration between the public and the private sector. Because neither is able to solve the problem by itself. The public sector cannot solve freight issues by itself, neither the private sector could solve this issue by itself. Collaboration is required, and for the challenge to collaboration is that history of confrontation between the two sectors that need to be overcome. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, people are saying hi from Toronto, from Ibarra, from all over Ecuador. Thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar. Um, we have another question. Pablo Santiago Maldonado wanted to know if um, you can tell us uh, about how Quito, for example, runs day and night. How can we implement the night delivery here in Ecuador? If some marketplaces won't want or won't be able to receive the goods at night, what are the ways local governments could implement this type of deliveries in developing countries overall? 
what is needed for it to be successful. Again, many of the, uh, when you think about freight, we tend to think about the truck, about the truck, the, about the, the trucking companies and the like. Uh, the activity that they conduct is not generated by them. It's generated by a, a receiver that the man supplies and a shipper that is sending these supplies. You have always a shipper, a receiver, and then you have the trucks that move cargo from one to the other. And in, in the case of the, of the night deliveries, it, the, per, the group that we need to convince are not the carriers. The carriers like to do night deliveries. The problem are the receivers. And, and these policies uh, work by convincing receivers to accept deliveries at night. In the case of Bogota and Sao Paulo, the both uh, private sector and public sector are collaborating to convince receivers to do that, particular receivers uh, located in major commercial centers and things like that. But again, it's not the policies are oriented to induce the receivers. And what we have recommended is to provide a, a, a financial incentive for the receivers to get delivered at night. This is what was done in New York and it worked fairly well. And this is basically similar approach have been taken in other cities and also work well. But again, it's about convincing the receivers. Okay, perfect. We have another question, a little bit different. Um, Freddy says, yesterday in Dubai, Hyperloop One signed a letter for develop a port to containers running through a tube system in Hyperloop transport. How, what is the impact of the system? Well, and <laughs> all the transportation experts I know of are puzzled by what Hyperloop is. And the reality is that <laughs> I don't know many of them who knows. We need to wait and see what is that. But the reality is that uh, uh, nobody seems to know details. And I have as possible as anyone else. Okay, perfect. And um, we have what time is it? We have one more question. Uh, what kind of strategies on policies can cities develop as e-commerce starts to grow and affect traffic in cities? E-commerce is basically a, one of the most complex problems to deal with because again, as you as you saw in my in my slides, the number of, of internet deliveries is growing rapidly and in most cases uh, people who buy stuff in the internet they want the stuff fast uh, and that and delivering fast goes against sustainability delivering fast goes against consolidation of cargo and that is something that, that we need to uh, basically be proactive and maybe educate consumers our citizens, so that, that whenever they have the chance, that they select the slower delivery times. Because typically, if you ask, if you do not specify the super fast deliveries, the slower deliveries tend to be more sustainable, because that allow the carriers to consolidate more cargo. Uh, we also need to develop policies to allow a more uh, efficient use of the space. Let's say if you have a typical a, a parcel delivery truck, let's say FedEx, UPS and the like, they could make about 80 stops, 80 in a tour. That means they move the truck from, maybe from one block to the next to make a delivery. If we use, for instance, delivery lockers, Let's say the truck doesn't go, doesn't make deliveries to each 
uh, individual customer, instead they deliver to lockers, that basically increases the sustainability of deliveries because it reduces the amount of travel. If these trucks may deliver, for instance, to a, a small staging area, that could be, imagine, two or three parking lot, par parking spaces in the center of the city, and you have cargo bikes, I mean, electric uh, bicycles to move the cargo, they could do, the, the electric bikes could do the delivery from the staging area to the individual customers. We need, in essence, change logistical systems. Because if we have, with the old model, or seeing trucks making delivery to each and every location, cities are going to drown in congestion. Mm. And these are some examples. Well, there are others. So. Okay. Um, we have another question from Noriel Santa Maria Sanchez. Uh, is there a planning guide to improve the charging system in medium-sized cities? What do you mean charging system? Um, if Noriel can answer that, we'll wait and continue with another question. <laughs> okay. Um, as freight operators are more concerned about profit, how best to induce behavior changes among the freight operators in order to achieve public policy goals? What we have found is that, uh, I mean, as all economic agents, uh, we tend to try to seek maximization of our own returns. And that's, that's natural behavior. The question is very important, how do, we, how do we do that? Well, we have conducted a humongous amount of research on, on behavior and how to induce behavior changes. What we have found is very interesting. Uh, the trucking companies, the but they maxim the profit maximization rules in many cases are well aligned with social objectives. Let's say, examples. How do a trucking company maximize uh, profits? One, uh, increasing the use of their fleet, maximizing the use of their assets, to minimizing traveling congestion. But what is social optimal? Maximizing the use of the assets, minimize traveling congestion. They are in sync. Private objective is similar to social objective. Why, why do they travel in congestion, for instance? The traveling congestion is not because they like congestion, it's because the receivers demand that they make deliveries during the peak hours. The behavior that needs to be changed is the behavior of receivers. Receivers are the ones that order, that make, that make delivery orders. Receivers are the ones that says how many delivery, how many delivery have to be made and when. Just by changing receivers, the behavior of receivers, you have a tremendous impact on the amount of freight traffic. In essence, we need to take a look at freight activity. Uh, it's not an end by itself. The, the freight, the trucks that you see in the streets are nothing more than the physical manifestation of this production and consumption relation I mentioned before. If you want to, if you want to change the behavior of the trucks, change the behavior of the receivers and the shippers. That is the question. And you do that through incentive, education, regulation, and you name it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Limberas. Uh, we are right on time, so if it's okay with you, we'll have one more question. Um, do you think the use of drones are part of the solution for improving freight transportation systems? Absolutely not. The reason is uh, that uh, imagine the, the New York City met metro area. You have 1.4 million deliveries 
every single day. For every person in the New York City area, uh, about 45 kilograms per person per day are transported every single day. I mean, imagine 1.4 million drones flying away. Simply impossible. That might be that might be a solution for let's say high end a, a high priority cargo might be a solution for very inaccessible places let's say delivering to a remote village in which a drone might get faster than a truck let's say for delivery of medicine well, you cannot transport I mean 10 kilograms of whatever using a drone. That's not possible. They do not have the, that payload capacity. That might be a good thing for a very light deliveries, maybe internet deliveries. I mean, the high end is too expensive. Uh, and the amount of airspace that this thing will take could be tremendous. I, 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 I don't have any. Uh, I do have, a, there are all technologies that could be, of, could have a great impact. Google trucks, platoon, I mean, these technologies could have an impact on free activity. But drones, I, I don't see that happening in my lifetime. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jose Olguin Veras, on behalf of the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing of Ecuador. and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR. We would like to thank you and thank all of our attendees uh, for this webinar on policies to improve freight transport systems in cities. After the webinar closes, a window will open on your screen with a short questionnaire, uh, which will also be sent to you by mail tomorrow. Uh, please, if, if, you all are, if all of our attendees can fill it out to receive the certificate of participation that will also be given uh, through mail. Also on your screen, you can see our social media. We invite you to follow us and visit our webpage um, where this webinar will be available. We all, it, it is also available on Pinterest and in our, our social media. Uh, we just wanted to remind you that the registration for Habitat 3 is already open. We invite you to register free of charge at our webpage um, that you can see on your screen right now or also in the UN webpage, which is Habitat 3, with the number 3, dot org. Also on September 6 and 7, we will have a new set of webinars on challenges of Habitat 3. Uh, you can register for those also on our social media on, or on our webpage, or at UNITAR's webpage as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jose Olguín Veras, and uh, we hope you have a good day. Thanks a lot.